Encore. Encore is the nothing personal word of the day. It is Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021. Right off the top of the show, happy birthday, Jack McKeon. Trader Jack, 91 years old today. Trader Jack was the oldest manager to win a World Series at the time he won a World Series. And I spoke to him last night for his birthday. Wanted to make sure that I spoke to him. So I call him every year for his birthday, but I wanted to reach him because at 91, why wait, right? He's going to go to church today as he always does. He regaled me with some stories about our time with the Marlins. Talked about the fact that he's with the Washington Nationals and will never sadly work for the Marlins again. Still bitter with Jeter for what Jeter did to him. And I said, Jack, you got to let it go. He said, but they love me there, Sparky. I said, I know. He's the one who named me Sparky, by the way. And I said, I know, Jack, but let it go. Life's too short. Don't be bitter. He's not bitter. I said, don't be angry. I'm not angry. I said, what are you, Jack? He said, disappointed that I don't get to be around the fans who love me so much and I love so much. I said, Jack, that's a perfect way to put it. He told me a quick story, Jack McKeon did, about Encore. That's why it's the word of the day for two reasons. We were talking about 2004 and how hard it is to repeat and how difficult it is to get players once they've won to have the exact same drive to win again. Something that we talk about in Nothing Personal quite a bit. You build up to win a World Series. You get close, then you get closer, then you get closest, and you just want it, and then you do it, and then all you want to do is do it again, but there's something missing. And you address it during spring training. And he reminds me of the speech he gave in spring training of 2004. We had lost Derek Lee. We had lost Pudge Rodriguez. But we pretty much were going for an encore with a great group of players. And he just asked them to pretend that they didn't win last year. That last year was in the past. But you can't. It doesn't work that way psychologically. And throughout the entire season, the psychologic status of our team was, it's going to happen right now. Just like that, we'll start winning. And that never happened. Encore is something that every front office thinks about at the end of every season. It's pretty binary, actually. At the end of a season, every team says, we've got the group. We just didn't get it done. We don't have the group. We need a new group. When you've got the group that just didn't get it done, you have to say to yourself, do we keep that group together? Was there something about last year that with another year of maturity, we can get it done? A year of experience. It's like the NBA when the Bulls had to get past the Pistons and you get close and you just have to get past that team and finally you do. A playoff loss, you'd say, a series loss is necessary to win the series the next year. So there's a team I want to talk about that was the surprise team of Major League Baseball this past year, the San Francisco Giants. And for all the listeners on the West Coast, fans of the Giants, fans of Farhan, fans of Gabe Kapler, the manager of the year, they did win manager of the year, executive of the year. They won 107 games, won the National League West, as you recall, lost in a crazy series to the Dodgers, an unbelievable series, actually, the 106-win Dodgers. So the minute they lose, they lick their wounds and they get back together and they say, all right, what's our plan? Can we do an encore? Is this our group? One of the biggest pitfalls of running a team is delusion. The reason that's a pitfall is that if you get it wrong, the encore, You've basically screwed yourself, not just for the next year, but potentially for years going forward. The encore is when you take all the players who are going to be free agents and you bring back as many as you can because you say, this is our group. The San Francisco Giants, by definition, can't do an encore because Buster Posey retired, but that's like the Marlins losing Pudge. But yesterday they announced two big signings that have been lauded by the Bay fans, by Steve Perry, thinking that the lights are now going to be on at Pac Bell at Oracle Park into October again. 
They signed a former player of ours, a former draft pick who will go down in history with the Marlins because we traded him for, I don't remember who we traded him for. Oh my God, Coca. It was in my head when we were starting the show. Anthony Descalfani was a Marlin player. We liked him as a young starter, but as with many starters where we screwed up, they weren't good enough, fast enough, so we'd trade him. Not having the patience to wait, hoping to recapture and have an encore of our 03 championship year where the young players were good enough, but what we didn't realize is they needed a year or two prior to that to be good enough. There is a laundry list of players who we got rid of because we didn't think they were good enough and they ended up being good enough elsewhere. Ah, we traded him for Matt Latos. Thank you, Coca. God, Latos was a performing pitcher for the Reds. Can I just try to defend that trade for one second, Coca, if you don't mind? We wanted experience in the rotation. We wanted an innings-eating arm. We wanted a bulldog pitcher, great lower body, power arm. 200 innings who we thought would 16 to 17 victories. We trade Descalfani. We take on Latos's money. He comes into spring training. We introduce him before that. Everything's great. Spring training, good. And then all of a sudden, he just started getting ornery, grumpy, and then sucking. And that's a bad day when you're a president of a team when you open your eyes and you say, oh Christ, we made a mistake. And knowing that you made a mistake is different than admitting you made a mistake. There's always a time in between. The time in between is when you know it, but you're not telling your owner or when the GM knows it, but he's not telling the president. So therefore the owner doesn't know either. That happens with draft picks a lot where you just keep the draft pick in the system because he's a number one pick and you think he's going to pan out, but the GM knows he's not going to pan out, but he doesn't tell the president. And the president says, why is he hitting 220? Why is his ERA five? Don't worry, we're developing him. It's going to work out. And then finally, when rosters have to be decided at the end of a season, you realize that we're going to designate a draft pick and they come to you and say, sorry about the $2 million. And I say, it's all right. I go to the owner. He says, it's not all right. Get me a list of every player who's made it and every player who hasn't made it because I think I want to fire the scouting director. That happens. So then I woke up and realized, oh, God, Latos is not going to help us win. As a matter of fact, there's a decent-sized chance that he's going to make help us lose. So we ended up getting rid of him. Latos, that is. So the Giants got together and said, let's sign Descalfani. We gave him a qualifying offer for $18.4 million. He turned it down. And then they re-signed him to a three-year, $36 million deal. And so in my mind, I get to say to the owner, hey, listen, instead of paying Descalfani 18, we're only paying him 12. We just saved $6 million off our payroll. Of course, in my black bag, I've got the three-year payroll and he's on the payroll for three straight years at 12. But shh. We don't have to talk about that right now. Then we're going to bring back Alex Wood, and we're going to give him a two-year deal at $5 million a year. What a bargain. We're going to give a qualifying offer to Brandon Belt. He's going to take it, and he did. That's 18.4. We got Crawford. Oh, he's good. He's good. Let's extend him. We're going to extend him for $16 million a year. And bing, bang, boom, we've got some room left in our payroll We're going to have an encore here. The problem with the encore, if you're the Giants, is when you've got a season where five or more players have career years, guess what's not going to happen the year after? Bingo. Yahtzee. Six sixes. They're not going to have career years two years in a row. It's unheard of. It doesn't happen. So I feel for the Giants. So I'm going to have an extra early wait to see, Coca. Not part of the show because I just realized how could I miss this. The San Francisco Giants will not win 90 games. Forget 107. They will not win 90 games in 2022. Put it in the document. Book it. That is an official wait to see where we'll revisit it, tell you whether we're right, tell you whether we're wrong. By bringing back the players, let's keep the band together. Let's run it again. Let's do an encore. 
that encore is going to be worth 17 games fewer in 2022. Lightning in a bottle? Maybe once, but definitely not twice in a row. All right, Coca. Give me some music. You know what I want? (laughs) I want to talk to Samson. You know what I want. So you want to talk to Samson's a segment we do. Samson's a character from a movie, Half Baked. I just got a printout. I'm, I'm looking at my hand on YouTube. Nothing personal with David Samson like I'm looking at a printout. But I did get something with the numbers, and there are a lot of new people. So so you want to talk to Samson. Half Baked, there's a character named Samson. It's a great movie with Dave Chappelle, by the way. Get yourself 15 16th Baked and watch it. And then get on my Twitter at David P. Samson. Hit follow and ask a question. Hello, David. Hello. It's always a good start to a question. Will A-Rod be elected into the Hall of Fame? That's a very short, concise, succinct, amazingly topical question, which increases your odds considerably to making the show. Will A-Rod be elected in the Hall of Fame? Why are we talking about that? Because today was the day, yesterday was the day, Today's November 23rd, it happened on November 22nd, when the 2022 Baseball Hall of Fame ballot was announced. It's always a big day. It's an honor. I remember speaking to Conine when the ballot came out and his name was on the ballot. I I can't describe to you what Conine said to me other than to summarize, which was, there is no chance I'll be on the ballot a second year. You need 5% of the, bo- of the vote to stay on the ballot for another year. He said, I'm not going to get 5%, but my Hall of Fame candidacy ended by being on the ballot, which is an honor that an overwhelming majority of players do not get. So just being on the ballot is super cool. So someone like Prince Fielder is not a Hall of Famer, but he's on the ballot this year. Joe Nathan's not a Hall of Famer. He's on the ballot. Jonathan Papelbon, Jake Peavy, A.J. Pruszynski, great honor, but not going to make it even to a year two. Jimmy Rollins. But the real name on the ballot for the first time, and there's two to talk about, David Ortiz and Alex Rodriguez. This is the steroid ballot of all time. David Ortiz steroids. Alex Rodriguez, steroids. First year. Joining for a final run, Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa. It's the quartet of needles. Uh, uh, Like the barbershop quartet, instead of using like a blade to do your sideburns or to cut your hair. What, What blade number do you like? A one, a two, a three? This is the needle quartet. Clemens, Bonds, Sosa. Wait a minute, it's not a quartet. Is that a quartet? It's a quintet. Kurt Schilling's on the ballot for the last time. He's not going to get in, even though there's a thought that he didn't want to be on the ballot because he's so annoyed with it. Do you remember that? Remember Schilling got 71.1%, so the odds are he's going to get in. He came that close. All you need is 75%. He was at 71.1%, Kurt Schilling was. Does he get in this year? I'm still a no. Kurt Schilling does not, should not get into the Hall of Fame. But what about Bonds and Clemens in their last year? What do you think? They were at 61 to 62% of the vote. They're right there. Nope. NGTH. Unless, is this the year where they look at Poppy, they look at A-Rod, they look at Bonds, they look at Clemens, and they say, let's just swallow hard. Let's do it all at once. Last year, we didn't let anyone in. Let's let everybody in. Your hat size increased by two. You're in the Hall of Fame. You pitched till you were 75. You're in the Hall of Fame. You sued baseball and acknowledged after line for half your career that you did steroids. You are in the Hall of Fame. What do I do with A-Rod? What do you do with a player like that? One of the great redemption stories, he was persona non grata with Major League Baseball. He was involved 
in Balco. Balco or Biogenesis? Why am I confusing the two? One was one was Bonds and one was Florida. There was the whole movie by Billy Corbin that we reviewed, Screwball. You should watch that. Alex Rodriguez signed that huge contract in Texas. No thought of steroids. Is it possible? Is it not? Said no. Got involved with Biogenesis down in Florida where Rob Manford, before his commissioner, started paying people to be witnesses to find out what was going on, who was doing steroids out of Miami. That's the whole Ryan Braun crew. Then one day, A-Rod met the media and said, Mia culpa. I did it. I shouldn't have done it. He pulled an Andy Pettit and a Jason Giambi, except he did it after line. That means you didn't do an Andy Pettit or a Jason Giambi who just said, yeah, I did steroids. I want to get better, faster. A-Rod tried to cover it up for so long that he was willing to sue anybody, go full scorched earth. And then he said, I can't win this. That's a tough day when you're having an argument. Do you ever do this in your life or in, or in your business when you're holding on to a position? You feel like General Custer? And you have the moment where you know in an argument with your significant other, let's say, or with anybody, that you know you're not going to prevail. Let me try one more time. You don't prevail. No, no, but I'm going to do a slightly different approach. You don't prevail. And then you say, all right, you were right. I knew it the whole time. I'm giving up. I'm going full hanky. This is my Schwitz rag that you now see on camera if you're watching this on YouTube. A white handkerchief. I'm holding up the handkerchief. I can't lie anymore because the evidence is so overwhelming that there is no way to credibly stick to my story, which goes counter to my view, which is I'm sticking, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So A-Rod comes clean goes clean, gets clean, dates J-Lo, works for Fox, works for ESPN, becomes a sympathetic hero, thinking that young people have forgotten or don't care. Older writers are over it. And this is my ticket to Wonka land. It's definitely not called Wonka land in Charlie and the chocolate factory. What is the land called? Coca may not even know this. But this is my golden ticket. And I'm going to give up my position. So A-Rod does an interview, comes clean. And now he's eligible for the Hall of Fame. Do you think it's a coincidence? Do you think that these players have a plan and know when five years after they last played, what potential year they are in the Hall of Fame? A-Rod was the first ballot Hall of Famer before he put the first needle in, just like Bonds was. We can't reward Alex Rodriguez by putting him in in his first year. We cannot send that message to young players, to any players, to any owners, to any fans, that what Alex Rodriguez did is in any way redeemable and should in any way be rewarded by a Hall of Fame election. The only way I'm wrong is if the writers decide to make this the year of the needle. Will they? I think not. Will Alex Rodriguez be elected into the Hall of Fame? That's a definite maybe, but a guarantee that it won't be in his first year. When we come back, we're going to talk about LeBron James and the fact that I'm not going to Madison Square Garden to watch the Knicks-Lakers tonight. And we also have to talk for a minute about what's going on with the NFL and Congress because it's a pretty big deal, folks. We will be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing. Coca and I are with you every day. Even on Thanksgiving, you know what, Coca? Let's do a mailbag episode for Thanksgiving. I don't like when the feed is empty even for a day, even though come December you're going to Europe. I don't know what we're going to do while you're in Europe. Coca's going to Europe. I think a month from now he's back from Europe. That's how soon you're going. Are you packed yet? 
got your passport ready? Are you getting boosted before you go? I know you're double vaccinated. You should get the booster before you go. I assume you will get it soon. So I watch a movie every day. It's Oscar time. King Richard came out about Richard Williams, the father of Venus and Serena Williams. King Richard is a movie starring Will Smith, who is trying for his first ever Oscar, been nominated twice for Pursuit of Happiness and Ali, looking for the win, playing Richard Williams. Not a hero in any way, a true tennis dad. A man who admitted that he had children for the sole purpose, these two children, to make them into tennis stars. Now, back in the day, there were thoughts that he wanted to take the tennis world by storm, the all-white world by storm. There were thoughts that he wanted to take his black daughters and make a statement. That's not true. He wanted to get rich. He decided they were going to be tennis players and that he was going to make them into pro tennis players before they were even a sperm hitting an egg because he saw a tennis tournament where the winner of the tournament won like 30 grand. He said, this sounds good. Everyone says Venus and Serena Williams from Compton, grew up in Compton. True, but not by necessity, but part of the plan. Richard Williams wanted them to grow up and be tough and see what it would be like if they weren't successful. He worked them to the bone, and he turned out two champions. But while we were living through the Venus and Serena prime, right now they're 41 and 40, while we were living through their prime, Venus turned pro in 94, Serena in 96, Richard Williams was looked at as belligerent, bizarre, scary, strange. This movie is The Last Dance. The Williams sisters are producers on the movie. They approved every scene. And basically, this movie is meant for you to forget what you knew about Richard Williams and assume that he's a sympathetic tennis dad. They try to show a word or two, but it doesn't work. Richard Williams did not cooperate with this movie. Didn't need to. His daughters did the heavy lifting for him. Will Smith's performance is above average, but not Oscar worthy. The story is above average, but not best picture worthy. It is an ode and homage to King Richard. But what's never discussed in the entire movie are the number of Richards whose daughters and sons don't make it. The number of Richards who want to live vicariously through their kids, build their kids into something that they could never be, weren't, give their kids and what in their mind and the parents' mind will be a better life. Where's the story of the people who don't make it? Nah, it's not good TV. It's not good movies. I want to see poor people get rich. I want to see people overcome adversity and win Wimbledon. Now, don't get me wrong. I've had the chance to meet Flex, both Venus and Serena. They're grounded. They're accomplished. They're charitable. They're funny. They're nice. They're smart. They're interesting. But for every Venus and Serena Williams, there are a million who never make it out of Compton. King Richard is worth your time. He really, in his mind, was King Richard. I, you know what? His nickname was King Richard. It, was that his nickname? Way before LeBron James was the king. King LeBron. King James. LeBron James was suspended yesterday. One game. I had it wrong on Twitter. I did not think the flagrant two foul against Isaiah Stewart was suspension worthy. I've seen worse tangles at the lines at Publix than what happened at the free throw line between the Pistons and the Lakers. I absolutely understood what Adam Silver was doing. He said, we cannot not, that's so many negatives. We must suspend LeBron to show other players and our fans and our sponsors that we will not kowtow to the superstars. Really, Adam, it is a superstar-driven league that you kowtow to them every single moment of every day. 
it's and you're a tall guy, but you are in the genuflect position more often than Bubba in prison. And yet now you suspend LeBron and you make him serve it the one day a year that he plays at the Garden. The one day a year that he plays at the Garden. He's suspended and won't play. Load management? You don't have to say it's load management now. You can just say he's suspended, serving his one game. How do the scalpers and the fans feel at the Garden right now? The Knicks are favored by five and a half points over the Lakers tonight now because LeBron isn't playing. That line is an outrage. Even though the Lakers are probably the biggest disappointment in the NBA, the Lakers will cover that spread. Nothing personal pick of the day. We're 18 over, 158 and 140. I thought the over-under for the Bucks giants game last night was 40, so I was all excited with the 30-10 to 10 final. Tampa crushed the Giants. Daniel Jones stinks. Tom Brady was fine. Certainly did nothing to give me an indication that they're going to be the NFC representative again, but he was fine. But it turns out the over-under was 50, and we had the over, so we lost 158 and 140. Pick for the day is Lakers plus 5.5 over the Knicks, while King... LeBron gets to go out with King Richard on the town. No garden for you. All right, we got to talk some NFL right now. Before we get to Congress and what's happening with the U.S. House Oversight and Reform Committee and all the documents they want from the Washington football skins scandal and the 650,000 emails, I want to take a moment to talk about Baker Mayfield. I'm going to tie Baker Mayfield in with other players who, after a bad game, decide they're going to stay in the training room, they're going to stay in the food room. They just don't feel like meeting the media. They send their manager to meet the media. The media finds other players while the media is skulking around the clubhouse pre-COVID or they're in the interview room post-COVID and the PR people for the teams have to send players into the media room. So they walk around the clubhouse begging, hey, do you mind going and doing the post game? Well, where's, where's the pitcher? He should go. He's the one who got rocked, gave up eight runs over three innings. Where's the superstar went 0 for 5 and struck out with the bases loaded down a run with one out in the ninth inning? Let him go meet the media. Nah, they're in the training room. Nah, they don't want to. Nah, they showered and left. All right, fine. I'll meet the media. 162 games in baseball plus the 30 spring training games every single day. Pre-game, post-game, the manager meets the media, and every single day, pre-game and post-game, the media gets to talk to the players. Football players play 16, now 17 games. They have to meet the media. There's media day during the week, but it is far, far fewer times than baseball players, and it makes me insane when players decide they don't want to meet the media. Baker Mayfield, after the Browns barely beat the winless Lions and the knee-biting, knee-capping, hamstring-straining, I'm about to get fired, Dan Campbell-led Lions lost. And the disappointing Browns won by a sliver. Baker Mayfield actually got booed in his home park. And after the game, was nowhere to be found. And the problem I had is Baker Mayfield is the one who always says I'm accountable. Baker Mayfield always says I'm the leader of this team. If you're the leader, you stand there and you take it no matter how you played, no matter how your team played. Because if you're only there when it's good and you're never there when it's bad, that makes you an owner, not a player, not a president, not a GM. You stand there and take it like a man. Instead, he met the media a day late and said, Hey, I was frustrated. Quote, I've never dodged any questions or hit away, so it's not about that. I was just frustrated. Removed emotions and all that from it. Just decided it was best to wait. That's not your decision to make, Baker. And don't at me with, oh, it's a mental health issue. We don't, it's not owed to us that these players meet the media. Yes, it is. That is part of their job. I'd like you to take the 10 things that are part of your job responsibilities, do the first date and say, you know what? I don't feel like doing the last two. It wasn't a great day. I didn't make the sales I wanted to make. I'm not gonna submit my sales report. It wasn't a great day. Felt like we had some complications in surgery. 
I'm not going to do my afternoon surgeries. Wasn't a great day. Didn't have a great show yesterday. Don't feel like doing it today. Had a great show. Don't feel like posting it. Meeting the media after you play is part of your job. It's as important as throwing touchdown passes. He actually said something so bad that after taking a full day to let his emotions pass, maybe to wordsmith a few answers, workshop a few concepts, he was asked about being booed. And he said, those are probably the same fans that won't be quiet while we're on offense and trying to operate. So I don't really care. How did that go for players when they, like uh, Javi Baez and Lindor, giving a thumbs down to their fans? Does it ever work when an athlete talks about his own fans ever that you can think of? Not for me. That'll do it for Baker Mayfield. I think that his biggest problem, yeah, I can't even talk about it. The Browns are completely overrated. They've been overrated from the beginning. Coco wants me to do a whole segment about Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry. And I don't want to do it, Coco. Maybe tomorrow. Let's talk more about it after the show. And maybe we'll do it tomorrow. But I want to, I, we got to get to subpoenas. I really want to, okay? All right. Something came out yesterday that I really want to explain to everybody. And I, and I want to explain it in a way that we can understand how our government works. The U.S. Congress, which is made up of people, members of the House of Representatives and senators, that's, that's the name for Congress. But there are different committees that can be convened. And the U.S. House of Representatives, they have an oversight and reform committee. That is a committee that is a bunch of reps, House of Representatives, who are elected by you, not your state reps, but your United States reps, not your local reps that were, you, were they're in the local capital. These are in the nation's capital. And they have the right to decide that they want to investigate anybody. All they have to do is send a letter and say, we'd like some more information. And that seems totally innocuous, right? No problem. We'll give you some information. We did a segment where we told you that this committee had sent a letter to Roger Goodell asking to see the 649,527 emails. Maybe it's 525,600 emails that had not been turned over. They wanted to see the written report about the culture at the Washington football skins why Tanya Snyder was taking over for Dan Snyder, why John Gruden was getting fired, and who else should be getting fired, what else is going on in terms of hiring practices, in terms of sexual discrimination, workplace harassment, workplace misconduct. We want answers. We are the oversight committee, and we're going to oversee you. And Roger Goodell said, hey, I appreciate the letter, but I'm going to Heisman you. I've Heisman the government from time to time. It's pretty easy to do. You put one hand over your face, you put another hand out, and you go into a delay tactic. The delay tactic is when you wait as long as possible before responding, you wait for another letter from Congress. Then you give them not what they want, not what they need. You give them something else that you want to give them, something that is not in any way remarkable but something that you think will allow the committee to say, all right, we got the information we looked, N-F-A-R. That's really all you're looking for. No further action required. You're looking for the committee to be able to have talking points, to tell their constituents, to tell the American people, we are here for you. We are looking out for you. But sometimes... This committee uses the power that it has, that it is granted to under the law, to subpoena people and subpoena documents. When you subpoena a document, you can't Heisman that. You've got to turn them over. Because if you don't turn over the requested documents that are under subpoena, guess what happens? Not only are you found to be in contempt, but it's possible that you've broken a law 
definitely, and that you could go behind bars. Not likely, but it's possible. And remember, the two major concepts that I live by, one, don't waste time because I can't get more of it, and two, if I want to leave this show, this house, this studio, this city, this state, this country, I am free as a bird, Leonard Skinnerd. Can do whatever I want whenever I want to. As long as I don't bother you or break the law, I'm free. So when something is subpoenaed, I'm going to answer that subpoena. But the government committee, this oversight committee, does not just willy-nilly subpoena documents or people. They save that for the items of great national interest. As a matter of fact, this committee basically recently, when gas prices were high and are high, they subpoenaed a bunch of oil company executives asking about climate change, actually, because they felt climate change was a big enough issue affecting enough people. They wanted to know what these companies were doing or not doing, could be doing, should be doing, won't be doing, would be doing, and what price it would cost if we made them do it by law. So they subpoenaed these executives and documents, et cetera, about climate change. What did you know? When did you know it? Like tobacco, like opioids. Will this committee use its subpoena power to get Roger Goodell to do what he absolutely does not want to do, which is to release these 525, 600 emails? What is the national interest that is being protected by looking into the WFT scandal? And I came up with it. And it's pretty compelling. It started years ago with the Me Too movement. Then we had the racial awakening. Then we had cancel culture. And what's happening is that all these companies have to hire chiefs of diversity and inclusion. All these companies have to look at their processes, look at their HR departments, find a way to keep workplaces safe. That was the statement that was made in the National Hockey League with the Chicago Blackhawks scandal. We want to make the environment, the hockey environment safe. USA Gymnastics, we want to make gymnastics safe. Everyone wants to make something safe after it was dangerous. Too many people are dying in car crashes, wear a seatbelt. Too many people are dying of smokers' lung cancer. We better put a label on the cigarettes. Too many people are overdosing on opioids. We better find Big Farm and take care of them. Too many hurricanes are happening and big storms. Something's happening with climate change. You better take care of that. Is what's going on right now enough? I say yes. The reason why I think subpoenas are possible by this Oversight and Reform Committee is that I think they will decide that there's a national interest to be served. I think they will decide that having workplace misconduct eradicated, which can never happen, it's like saying we're going to eradicate domestic violence. God, I wish we could find a way to. But the fact of the matter is that when Congress sees something and they believe they can say something, they're going to use someone as an example. Do you think by them subpoenaing the documents from the Washington football skins that their constituents will not vote them for re-election? Because that's the question they actually ask. They say it's national interest. They come up with the reason why it is national interest or why it's not. And then they decide, do they want to engage in this? And if so, how will it impact their careers, their reelection, their ability to fundraise? And the NFL is a behemoth, make no mistake. The NFL is loved by a overwhelming majority of their constituents who gamble on it, who play fantasy football, who love to watch games and be a part of the league. But guess what happens when these emails go public, when they're subpoenaed? when more people have to be fired or punished, it will have, wait for it, zero impact on the business of the National Football League, zero impact on the game that is played in the National Football League, therefore zero impact on whether or not these members of the House will get reelected. 
So you're going to hear a lot more about this story going forward. I assure you of that. Because while nothing's been subpoenaed yet, this committee is this close. I'm holding my fingers super close together. You can't shine a flashlight through it. They are this close to subpoenaing the NFL because Roger Goodell is being so cocksure that he thinks the Heisman will work forever. The Oakland A's announced last weekend that they're going to go one step further in their plan to leverage Oakland to get a better deal to build a facility by the harbor there in Oakland. They're going to Vegas every two or three weeks, and then they made a great announcement. They went a step further than I ever did when we threatened relocation before getting Marlins Park financed in a public-private partnership. The Oakland A's actually made an offer to buy land in Las Vegas. Hell yeah. That's my guy, John Fisher. He's the owner of the A's. Yes, he's wildly wealthy because all of you wear jeans, but that's not really the point. I wonder, does the Gap do leisure wear like Lululemon type athletic wear anymore? I wonder whether jeans have been impacted. Hmm. Anyway. So John Fisher makes a offer to buy land and then sends his president out to give you the quote of the day. I want to give it to you. And I want to give it to you exact because that's how good it is. Quote from their team president. We're kind of moving from a phase of research data gathering to action around a final site. He told the Las Vegas newspaper. That's really important because the site selection is a really critical path to keep the process moving forward. Here it is to where we could have a holistically blessed project. That's a standing ovation quote, a holistically blessed project. I want to read to you something, if you don't mind. A holistic process is characterized by comprehension of the parts of something as intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. Did you get that, what holistic is? The holistic process? Intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. How can you threaten to move to Las Vegas when you don't have a stadium deal in Las Vegas? How can you have a stadium deal in Las Vegas if you don't have a place to build the stadium? How can you have a place to build the stadium if you don't have the land? And how can you have the land if you don't buy the land? And how, pray tell, can you buy the land if you don't make an offer? For those of you in Miami, do you remember when David Beckham bought a bunch of land to build the soccer stadium? out north of Marlins Park, where there was no parking, and they had a press conference. It was a huge deal. We've bought the land. We made a deal. You enjoying watching the Miami soccer team play in Fort Lauderdale, because that's where they're still playing? Putting an offer in to buy land. Don't be fooled, people in Oakland or Vegas. Don't let them use that as the final leverage point that they can pole vault over the finish line. They're playing it right from the playbook. They've got the commissioner behind them, allowing them to pursue relocation in Vegas. Now they've got an offer in on land. You know what the next step is? It's going to happen. They're going to buy that land. Do you know how rich people get richer? Because they buy things and when they can't use them, they sell them again and they make money. Or they buy things for one purpose. They decide they can't use it for that purpose. So they use it for another purpose. Where's the land? We do not know. How much did they spend? We do not know. Was it a deposit? Was it a promise to pay? We do not know. You want to speak about holistic processes? Processes? I'll speak about holistic processes. You don't need to make an offer to buy land in another place in order to get a deal done in the city in which you are going to end up in the first place. But I love where your head's at, John. I love that you think it's necessary. 
take the survey. The Oakland A's are still not moving to Vegas, I promise you. But when you make an offer to buy land, you're doing the best you can because you can look at your fans in Oakland. You can look at all the politicians in Oakland who you're still negotiating with. You can wink and just say, hey, it's just business. This is nothing personal.